Welcome to the Cinematologist podcast. I'm Neil Fox. It's really nice to be back after a couple of weeks of silence on the airwaves following the release of our episode on Bertram Bonello's The Beast, which I hope people have managed to see uh, because it's great. And hopefully you enjoyed the conversation with Bertrand that I had. And it was, yeah, really nice to get some really, really nice messages from people about that. So thank you for everyone who reached out about that episode. Um, I felt very buoyed by the the messages I've received from doing this uh, solo this season. It's really sort of helped me stay connected to kind of making sure that the episodes are regular and high quality in what is a very busy term and a very busy half a year. So yeah, teaching's finished, which is nice and marketing was all done. The kind of summer admin of committees and boards is underway. And I've also been really busy with the release of my book, Music Films, which which came out at the end of May, on May 30th. So thanks again to everyone who sent photos of the book and their thoughts on it so far. It's been really, really encouraging that so many people have, have bought the book. And I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing people at the launch at the BFI on Monday, June the 24th. So I think there's still some tickets left if people want to join me and the filmmaker Caroline Katz, who's been on the podcast before, uh, to talk about my book and music films more broadly at the BFI library. 6 30 p.m i'm really really looking forward to that it's an honor to be able to to launch the book of the bfi and also looking forward to events with it in manchester and new york later this year which is really really exciting i was going to put this episode out last week but last week i was in edinburgh for a keynote talk scottish international film education conference which everyone acknowledges is a very long title um but the, the talk went really well and it was really fun it was amazing to be in Amazing to be in a room talking to the people whose work I sort of included and sort of built on in my doctorate, which I realised on the way up to Edinburgh I finished about ten years ago, literally to you know to to a month or two. So to be able to um, yeah to present to people like Meta Hurt and Duncan Petrie and Rod Stoneman, whose work is so important to me in terms of filmmaking education, was a real honour to be kind of one of the keynote speakers. Um, and I did, I did the paper on the Sound Image Cinema Lab with my good friend and colleague, Kingsley Marshall, which was also really nice in itself. And we talked a lot about our friendship and how that kind of came to sort of become a professional relationship, which uh, the lab sort of grew out of in my time here, which 11 years now I've been here at Falmouth, which is kind of mind boggling. So my guest for this episode is Pat Kelman, who I've known for a few years. Uh, Pat is a kind of major character on the Cornish film scene and I've known him through the films that he's released through his distribution company, 606 Distribution. And more recently through his brilliant film club, Pat's Film Club, which is hosted at the WTW Cinema uh, in Truro, which is a really lovely cinema. Um, and just sort of spending more time with Pat talking to him made me think, actually, I think he'd be a really great guest for the podcast because he's a real cinephile. He's got a really fascinating sort of journey through his life and through his career you know and it's clear that film is such an important part of his identity uh, as well as his kind of professional life in a variety of different guises and it was nice to talk to him because again it's a reminder of just what a vibrant community there is in Cornwall in terms of cinema you know that the, there'll be familiar names that pop up in this conversation particularly Mark Jenkin and Simon Harvey of the Harvey Brothers um, who have also had uh, on the podcast uh, with their film Long Way Back, which Pat helped distribute through 606. I wanted to talk to him as well because I think increasingly want to celebrate the fact that Cornwall is where I live. Uh, it's where I've made my home for 11 years and will be for the foreseeable, um, barring any kind of major HE collapse, which, as many people know, is not that far away, possibly. Um but it's also where I consume the most of my cinema. Um, it's, you know, it's home to some really lovely cinemas. I make films here. Um, I'd like to be able to use the podcast as a way of celebrating Cornish film culture. And Pat is a huge part of that. So I was really excited to be able to talk to him. It's a long conversation, but I think it's a really, but I think it's a really deep and insightful one. I think he's, I just found him fascinating to talk to and, and to hear how film has kind of permeated his life. Uh, from a very, very early age to what he's doing now. 
and the threads that sort of run through all of that, I think are really fascinating to listen to. I wanted to talk to Pat as well, because one of the great things I love about the film club is that it's in a cinema. Um, I've run film clubs um, and I've been to film clubs and there's so many great ventures that take place in venues, you know, the back rooms of pubs. I think I saw one um, on a flyer in Falmouth just yesterday for a film club that would be in a pub, you know, and there's loads of venues that open their spaces to makeshift film clubs. But the idea nowadays of a, of a, uni, of a, of a kind of mainstream chain, which is what WTW is here in Cornwall, um, opening their doors to a film club just feels really exciting because there's nothing like watching a film with, you know, sort of like-minded people um, in a kind of club environment where you do feel part of a community in a beautiful cinema. Um, you know, and there's something about that space being made available for these kinds of things, which I think is really important to celebrate. So huge thanks to um, Mark and the team at uh, WTW, not only for hosting the film club, but for hosting this conversation. Um, I spent uh, a lovely morning with Pat in the screen where his film club is hosted at the WTW Plaza Cinema. And it's just really lovely to sit there in the chairs and just kind of chat film uh, with someone who's so, so invested in cinema as an art form. This episode is out just after Pat's weekend uh, screening Texas Chainsaw Massacre around the Southwest, which he mentions in the podcast. And a couple of weeks before his next double bill, which is an action double bill, which kind of typifies Pat's approach, really. So the double bill is speed, which we've talked about in the podcast before, and anyone knows that I love speed, if you've listened to that episode. Um, but also Richard Lester's Juggernaut from the early 1970s, um, starring Richard Harris. And it's a brilliant movie, Juggernaut. And I remember talking to Richard Lester when I interviewed him for the 50th anniversary of A Hard Day's Night. And he got a little bit defensive when I was trying to say to him that he oversaw many of the kind of staple genres that have since become, you know, very, very sort of um, very, very commonplace in uh, sort of, you know, sort of in, in mainstream filmmaking, you know. So a lot of the kind of romantic comedy and romantic drama and action movie and particularly action comedy and something like Three Musketeers and then kind of suspense action movies like like Juggernaut. Like he was he was there at the start of a lot of what would become really kind of really crowd pleasing blockbuster genre movies and he was having none of it Richard Lester because he, he is a very humble and modest filmmaker who was just like no I just did my job you know he didn't want to take credit for anything but I think he's a really undervalued filmmaker um, who's made some absolutely fantastic work and Juggernaut is kind of cruelly underseen so for Pat to find it and screen it on the big screen alongside something like Speed which still holds up as you know one of the great action movies I think is just it's a real testament to Pat's knowledge of cinema, but also his desire to introduce people to films that they might not might not know. So I'm really excited for people to see Juggernaut, and I'm really excited to see it on the big screen because I've never seen it on the big screen. So that's something else that Pat's Film Club gives us the opportunity to do is get together, is to get together with like-minded souls, but also to kind of experience just the joys of cinema on a big screen. Um, and that's what he's doing with his amazing distribution company as well, is trying to get films which other distributors think are kind of too niche or too challenging up there on the big screen for audiences to share. And uh, I've got a lot of time and a lot of respect for Pat. And I really, really enjoyed this conversation. And I hope that you do too. So this is me deep in the annals of the WTW cinema in Truro, talking to film distributor and programmer, Pat Kelman. పట్టుకోవాలంటే వేటగాడు కావాలి ఆ పని చేయగలిగేది ఒక్కడే సార్
దానం కన్నా విలువైన నీ సోప తినా సొంతం అన్న గర్వంతోకి మనలో కలిసిపోతేనే బ్రిటిష్ ప్రభుత్వానికి ఎదురు తిరిగిన నేరానికి నేను అరెస్ట్ చేస్తున్నాను తొంగి తొంగి నక్కి నక్కి కాదే తొక్కుకుంటూ పోవాలి ఎదురు వచ్చినోడిని ఏసుకుంటూ పోవాలి చాలా ప్రమాదం ప్రాణాలు పోతాయిరా ఆనందంగా ఇచ్చేస్తాను బాబాయ్ యుద్ధాన్ని వెతుక్కుంటూ ఆయుధాలు వాటంతటవే వస్తాయి నక్కల వేట ఎంతసేపు కుంభస్థలాన్ని బద్దల కొడతాం పద Hello. Hi, you know. Yeah, it's really lovely to talk to you, and it's really nice to be in the screen two at the Plaza. Yep. It's become my kind of spiritual home, I guess, for my Pat's Film Club screenings, because this is my regular screen where we show the films. Yeah, it's such a beautiful screen, and we were saying on the way in, what a nice cinema. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful old cinema. I know it's been kind of, you know, kind of re, uh, re, redone into kind of, broken down into multiple screens and stuff, but you can still get a really good sense of the the beautiful kind of picture palace that it was. Yeah. And and also the staff here are fantastic. You know, they're really great. They couldn't do... There's nothing they wouldn't do for you, basically. Yeah, you no. Know. Yeah, our experiences with the uni um, on the film course has been the same, I think, as you. Just they're, they're open to everything. A couple of years ago, I did a conference and we wanted to screen Rebecca, yeah. 35 mil, and they were like, yeah, you know, um, one of the few cinemas in Cornwall can actually play 35 mil. Yeah, and uh, it's always an absolute treat to to watch to watch it here. Um, so you grew up in Cornwall? I did, yeah. I grew up in Portree, yeah. So what was your local cinema? That would have been a Regal in Red Roof. Yeah. Was, my re- was my local, yeah. Are you still going as well? Yeah, I still feel it's, it certainly is. It's doing very well, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to start really with your sort of formative experiences really in film. Yeah. Because I've been coming to the film club for a little while now and what's always interesting is how you how you more often than not talk about the, your programming choices through you know your own sort of biography in terms yeah. of films that you came to at certain times so just wondered if you could just sort of talk about yeah kind of your awakening into film really You're like what were the films and the time where you know you were drawn to it and what 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 was the what was the experience like for you of kind of getting immersed in cinema yeah i mean for me um you know, because I wasn't born in Cornwall. I was born just, I was born in Essex, but we moved here when I was a baby. Um, for many, for a few years, my mum kind of moved around the county um, trying to find the right place to live. And eventually, when I was about five, I think, we moved to Portrees. And that was in the 60s. And, you know, Cornwall in the 60s wasn't quite as inclusive and welcoming as it was to incomers. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I had some ch- I had kind of trouble kind of fitting in and kind of becoming kind of part of the community, I guess. And um, for me, I, I kind of started watching film on telly, obviously, late night shows, um, universal horror movies, that kind of stuff. And and I always found it as a, a way of kind of escaping from what whatever's kind of going on and bothering me. Yeah. Um, and so when I was old enough, 
which actually wasn't that old. It was like six-ish. Uh, <laughs> I would come into pl I'd come into Red Roof and they had Saturday morning film shows, mm. all the children's film foundation movies and yeah. you know shorts and stuff, and and that kind of introduced me to the experience of being in a cinema and being in a big audience, and um, it wasn't too long before I actually started going to films on, on my own mm. um, later on during the day. Um, I mean, the first one I remember was. Thunderbird 6, Jerry Anderson's Thunderbirds movie. Um, and I do remember that as being like, because it was like, I mean, the thing about the Jerry Anderson movies was that they were they were filmed like movies. They, yeah. were, they weren't filmed like telly or, or animation or puppet shows. They were filmed like action blockbusters. Yeah. Um, so I remember that being quite, a, quite a, an important one for me. Um, and then very soon after that, my mum started going to Bingo in Red Roos. and she would actually go and she'd do like the afternoon session then the evening session and so what she would do is she would drop me off in the cinema at the beginning of the matinee show at say two o'clock and pick me up at like half past nine yeah. <laughs> give me enough money to kind of buy sweets and popcorn and keep myself going during the day um and of course that was a day of days of continuous performances where you know, basically, they've just played a film again and again and again, yeah. and and so you could come and go almost, not quite as you wish, but you know. So very often, I would watch a film like two and a half times in a day, because it would play at two o'clock, then maybe again at four thirty, and then again at seven, and then of course, by the time she came out of bingo, it was like halfway through the th the final show, yeah. So she'd kind of pull me out of that. <laughs> so there were certain films that I saw, you know, I think they kind of may have, may have instilled my kind of willingness and my love of watching films again and again and again yeah you know yeah, yeah um i mean there's also part of my kind of neurodiversity as well in that i've got a slight autism in my family so i, mean, I think that whole kind of repetitive thing is something that that i certainly identify with how old were you at that point when you're being i mean that was literally from the age of like six or seven up to wow. about 11 and i went i went to La uh to to lanson then um, as a boarder at Lanson. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, like every Saturday, pretty much, I would be seeing whatever was on, as long as it was child-friendly. Um, you know, so I, they weren't letting me into adult films at that point. But, you know, I mean, I, so I had some really formative experiences during that time, and I remember um, a double bill that I'm hoping to redo here at the Plaza of the original Planet of the Apes mm. plus... Escape from the Planet of the Apes, which was the second sequel. Yeah, uh, they kind of skipped the the really dark middle one, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, I remember that you know playing two or three times yeah. of a day, and I just like watched it and just fell in love with those films. Um, and you know things like the um, the Jack Clayton remake of The Great Gatsby with uh, Robert Redford oh, and the yeah. I remember saying to my mum that I wanted a Gatsby haircut <laughs> based on, on 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 the hairstyling that Redford had in that yeah. film and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Well, maybe that was a big thing in that in that period, wasn't it? Oh yeah, but, you know, um, very uh, impactful film in terms of sort of the reemergence of that style because Redford was just iconic at that point. And, yeah, yeah. And then as you get older, you kind of you're already in just like the kind of the obsession of seeing as many movies as possible. Yeah. Um, what are some of the films that kind of sort of speak to you in terms of, you mentioned that you neuro, neuro neurodiversity and some of your introductions have alluded to sort of formative experiences around sexuality and sort of a sense of belonging in terms of like a recognition with certain types of characters. So yeah. what were some of those films that where you were like, oh, actually, these are the films that are kind of speaking to me as you're, as you're growing into As I'm growing into it. myself, yeah. I mean, the film... Um, when I was around 11 or 12... I started going to Plymouth because I was a boarding at Lawson College. And um, I'd go to Plymouth at the weekend to go and see films. And I think because the cinema owners didn't know me there and I looked older for my, older than my age, I was able to get into kind of older films. Mm. and um, Which is always a thrill. Which is always a thrill. <laughs> you know, I remember taking like 10 of my friends to go and see Alien when it opened. 
and uh, uh, two of them couldn't get in and it was really bad but you know i mean alien of course is 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 a formative film for a lot of people yeah i think in terms of their um introduction to kind of horror and stuff um my drama teacher introduced me to the film carrie well when it came out and i and i was like 12 you know and he was like have you seen carrie i went no he goes try and see if you can get in it's great and of course that was and that that was that and obviously you know in terms of like sexuality and stuff i mean obviously you've got the the kind of mildly soft core opening mm. in the in the in the in the you know in the uh changing room and stuff yeah but um i think the first film that really i identified with and really felt that i i had a character that really spoke to me was one flew over the cuckoo's nest mm. Okay. Yeah, that was that was actually the first ex certificate film I ever saw, and there was just something about Jack Nicholson. There was something about his rebelliousness, his don't give a shit attitude, yeah. his kind of, but also his kind of standing up against authority. Because you know, I really didn't like being a border. Why do you think they might think that? It don't make a bit of sense to me. Do you think there's anything wrong with your mind, really? Not a thing, Doc. Uh, excuse me, miss. Do you think it might be possible to turn that music down so maybe a couple of the boys could talk? Your hand is staining my window. God almighty, she's got you guys coming and going. Move change never hurt, huh? Move variety. Ah, oh, come on, you're not gonna say that now. You're not gonna say that now. You're gonna pull that hen house shit now when the vote that Chief just voted it was ten to nine. I want that television set turned on right now! I don't think he's overly psychotic. No, I want something! To... I think he's dangerous. <laughs> Jesus, I mean, you guys do nothing but complain about how you can't stand it in this place here, and then you haven't got the guts just to walk out. I mean, what do you think you are, for Christ's sake, crazy or something? Well, you're not. Hey, wait a minute. Ah, hold it. See how easy it is. We're from the, uh... State Mental Institution. Uh, this is Dr. Cheswick, Dr. Tabor, Dr. Scanlon. I'm Dr. McMurphy. Hey, Mikey! What? All right, take him over! Get on over here! Get up, Tabor! Hey. <laughs> How about it, you creep, you lunatics, mental defectives? <laughs> Never forget you. Um, you know, because basically I'm trying to, I mean, without getting too much into my own biography, although that is something I do quite a lot. Um, you know, my mum was brilliant and I loved her to bits, but she was not the most kind of strict or house proud. And so, you know, there was an element, I mean, element of what some people today might call neglect. I mean, when I'm talking, I remember talking about my going, being put in the cinema for a whole day. Yeah. Um, I used to program a little film club um, called the Hallion Club in, in Soho. Um with my old friend Sarah, Sarah McGuinness or Sarah Townsend. And um, and I remember we did a screening of The Towering Inferno, which I sat through two and a half times when yeah. I was in it. And I told that story. And then there was a journalist in the, in, the, in, the, in the room. And when I saw the article that she'd written for, I think it was Wallpaper magazine, she said, and Pat tells us this really moving story of childhood neglect. Mm. And I never saw it that way. Yeah. But, you know, some people might. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and so I think that was one of the kind of factors that that 
kind of influenced my decision to go to to to, to boarding school for that time. Mm. Um, and it wasn't like a public school or anything; it was just a comprehensive with a boarding yeah. house attached to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was just that separation from home that kind of gave me some structure and some you know focus, I guess. And you felt you needed that. That was as you sort of said there that you wanted to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the way it was always presented to me. Okay. It was presented yeah. to me as my decision. You know, my mum said to me, "Look, you've passed your eleven plus. <laughs> Drew School is going to be going comprehensive in a year's time, mm. so there's no real benefit to the eleven plus." She said, "But there is this school that, you know, that that's got a boarding house where, you know, you might get some support in." And so, you know, I was. You know, my mum always treated me like an adult, and that was part of the the, the, the thing. Um, and so I just went, well, why not then? Mm. You know, and I hated it. I really did. And I did want to come home, but then I was kind of forced to stay. <laughs> um, and so I, I think that's another, that's kind of why I kind of really responded to that whole kind of, that that attitude that McMurphy has in the film yeah. to, to, to the institution that he's part of, yeah, 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 you know, and and you know, and there were some real characters in the boarding house at Lawson, so you know, I, <laughs> I kind of could see lots of strange, you know, I could see all sorts of parallels in that film, yeah, with, you know, with that, and and uh, and of course, it's an extraordinary drama with a really powerful ending, and and so I just found a lot in that film that really spoke to me, yeah. You know, and um, and actually, when I was a little bit older, um, my mum rented a VHS player for me, one of the very first kind of Granada rental models, and I took it to we took it to put in school, and I basically had a little black and white telly, and I remember you could you could start to rent movies by mail order before before video shops yeah. really happened. And one of the earlier titles was One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm. So I managed to, to kind of rent that. And and I think I found somebody in the town I can't, who basically had another video recorder. We backed them up, you know, to record a copy of it. So I basically had that to watch whenever I wanted. Really. You haven't screened that yet, the film? I tried. Yeah. Um, yeah, because when I did um, The Double Bill of Midnight Express and Taxi Driver, mm. The plan was initially to do One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest plus Taxi Driver. Yeah. The idea being two films that really influenced me as a kid, mm. but also two magnificent performances from people nowadays. Younger audiences may not quite know why Jack Nicholson and, and Robert De Niro are so special. Yeah. You know, and so just a chance to show them in their prime mm. to a younger audience was something that I thought was quite important. Yeah. But we just couldn't find who had the rights to it. It's fascinating, isn't it? That 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 film is so hard to track down. Yeah, I mean, it's available on on all home video formats via Warner, you know. And and so we just thought, well, Warner's got it, and they said, oh no, well the BFI had it, so we contacted the BFI. They went, we don't have it anymore. Mm. And and I even tried my friend um, Ty Singh, who is part of Film Hub Southwest, yeah. and he I kind of call him the rights whisperer. Because he kind of knows, or he knows who to ask yeah. for virtually anything. I mean, he helped me. Ha he helped me track down a new acquisition for six hundred six, mm. uh, so I didn't know. I couldn't find who had the rights for that. And and he said, no one knows who's got the rights at the moment. Actually, it's just kind of fallen through the cracks. That's kind of amazing that a film like that can fall through the cracks. <laughs> to me, it's just you know beggar's belief. You know, because I'd have thought that. Or well, maybe it's because the BFI did a really nice theatrical re-release of it about four or five years ago. Mm. And I think then people might just think, well, actually, all the other rights are tied up. So, yeah. you know, we don't need the theatrical rights right now. Which says a lot about theatrical, doesn't it? Which we'll probably come back on to yeah. later um, when we get to where you are now, really. But um, thanks for that. That's really, it's really lovely to hear those those experiences and it's interesting listening to a lot of podcasts where people sort of talk about early forms and a lot of people in film who've made a, a life out of film have those very similar early experiences of yeah being left in a cinema or kind of being subjected to things too early you know oh, lots yeah. of those sort of common particularly in horror i think oh yeah common. i mean i was watching you know especially when video started i was watching horror films you know 
at the age of like 13, 14 ish, you know, and I do remember one time um, being in a biology lesson and the biology teacher went uh, could said, well, I've got to go for the, for an hour. Um, can you get on with stuff? And I slipped a copy of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre into the video with video player for the entire class to watch. Yeah. And how did yeah. that go? Well, oh. that went very well, but it was like, yeah, I, you know, maybe I'm not so proud of that. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, um, it comes full circle because uh, imminently there's a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So it's obviously, that's obviously a film that has stayed with you for a very, very long time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, interestingly, near to near to the Regal in Red Roos, um, my, other, my other nearest cinema was a cinema called the Cameo in Camborne. I mean that that's not that I think that was knocked down many years ago and it's now flats. But that was a, a small kind of flea pity type cinema in Ross Gear. And um they used to show kind of like, you know, softcore porn films during the week or um I mean that was all they did that for a long time and then they kind of started showing more mainstream stuff later during the week. But on a Sunday night they always used to do horror. And so that's where I first saw all the Lucio Fulci films. It's where I first saw Shivers. It's where I first saw Rabid. First, 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 saw, uh, first saw Dawn of the Dead. You know, so all of yeah, those yeah, kind of... Wow. So I saw those on a big screen, you know, when they when they came out pretty much, you know, or as soon as they started going on general release. Mm -hmm. And um, in a lot of these films I'd heard about already because... Um, one of the things that my mum bought me as a birthday present when I was about, I don't know, 11 or 12, was a subscription to the monthly film bulletin. Okay. Um, yeah, because I haven't even talked about my, my solo trips to London as a teenager <laughs> on my own at like 13, yeah. you know. But um, where well, I'd literally just go and watch films all day. I didn't do the whole, you know, I was too, I was actually too kind of innocent in a weird sort of way to, or too scared of the world to go to like Soho and do all that mm. kind of stuff where a yeah. teenager might, yeah. but I would go and just like watch films all day or theater mm. all day, or, you know, I'd, I'd literally, you know, four films a day mm. kind of thing in London for a, for like three days. Um, and of course the National Film Theater at the time, BFI South Bank now was a place that I used to sometimes go then. And so, you know, I got membership at the BFI. I had the subscription to monthly film bulletin. So literally at the time, that would be reviewing every single film that was released every month, yeah. No matter how good or bad or whatever, and and so you know, I started, I scoured it every month to what, see what was coming up, what was new, what looked interesting to me, and then I'd try and find ways of see if it was going to be on video. But if not, I would, you know, save it up for my next trip to London, or I'd try and find a see where it might be playing in Cornwall, yeah. That kind of thing, and the ca and the cameo was a place where some of that horror stuff was popping up. That's where a lot of that horror stuff stuff popped up. So I'd kind of get weekends home. I'd get a weekend home and I'd go on a Sunday night to no. to, to that. And but that's where you saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the first time. No, I first saw that in London actually. Okay. I, I saw that at the classic Charing Cross Road. Again, another cinema that doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, because um, of course that was a film that was actually banned in the UK. Mm. Um, the BBSC didn't give it a certificate, and it, it, in the end, it, it was given a an X certificate by Camden Council, and or it might have been the GLC. But you know, basically, you could see it in London, but you couldn't see it anywhere else. Yeah, and so that had to be saved up for a trip for London. That was like a special event, going to see that, and you know, and it's an incredible film. I yeah, mean, yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, and I. Uh, yeah, so I saw all the other kind of, and also sometimes on my trip, day trips to Plymouth from from from, from Lance, and I would go, I'd go to Plymouth on a weekend, um, given a lift by my old English teacher and his wife. They would give me a lift in there, drop me off at like midday, yeah. pick me up at six o'clock, and I'd just go do whatever I wanted. And I went to see. That's when I that's when I saw all the classics that I really loved from that period. Yeah. You know, Cuckoo's Nest, Taxi Driver, you know, all that stuff. Um, but sometimes the ABC in Plymouth would put those classic horrors, well, they're classic now, but at the time they were very new, um, on one of their little screens, so I'd go and see. I remember seeing a double bill of Shivers and Rabbit, even though I'd seen them already, yeah. seeing them together on a double bill in Plymouth. Nice. Again, the rewatching 
top. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And people like Cronenberg. I mean, Cronenberg really, he was my favorite director at the time, yeah. actually. You know, he was, there was something about that kind of mixture of exploitation, but also kind of body horror yeah. and, and revulsion as well, which is quite of interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, I look forward to that double bill. So wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Be great. Um, yeah. So obviously, kind of talking a lot about the film club there. Um, you've had a really interesting life in film. You know, in terms of the things that you've tried, spent time doing. You know, um, do you want to talk, talk a little bit about that in terms of like yeah. that that move into sort of adulthood and yeah, your sort of journey through film to where you are now? Yeah. I mean, when I was. Um... Yeah, when I I did you know I did my A level in drama down here in Cornwall at Campbell Cornwall College Campbell Tech, and I actually remember um, the year before I started my drama course, um, I'd had a year out between my A levels and and GCSEs. Um, basically, I did one year of A level at Lawson, did some holiday repping, and then didn't come back, and so I had a year in between. Yeah, well, I kind of did like a a YTS scheme, a, a place affiliated with Cornwall College. And, uh, and again, I used to bring in videos and, and people would like show them, and one of which being a film that I've now just acquired, which we'll talk about later. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I did my A-levels in drama, and during that whole time, I found a little tribe of people that I really got on with, my A-level, you know, my A-level drama group. Yeah. Um, you know, some of whom are really good friends now, like Stacey Guthrie, who's an artist in... Oh, yeah, in uh, yeah, she was in my, she was in my year. No. Um, and Jerry Finch was the was the drama drama lecturer there. And Paul Vibert was the English English lecturer. Uh, lecturer. And um, and that's really where Pat's Film Club started because pretty much every Saturday night or every other Saturday night, I would have an all-night video night at my house. Mm. And friends would, friends from college would come along. There'd be like 10 of us, and we'd literally watch films all night. Um, and it was almost like I was kind of curating the night as well. It's a lot of the time, they were films that I'd chosen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I remember Cat People being played quite a lot, the the Paul Schrader, Schrader yeah. the Schrader one, because um, of my teenage obsession with Anastasia Kinski. Uh, and, uh, um, yeah, I and so that was really kind of where it... I started kind of like sharing stuff. Yeah. And I remember my first day at uni um, when we were all in the drama department. We were all, this is at Royal Holloway, um, University of London. And I remember being in, in a big group. We were all kind of meeting for the first time. And my way of introducing myself and my way of trying to make friends was to say, oh, if you want to come around and watch movies at mine, I, you know, I do these movie nights. You're very welcome to come. So that was my way of trying to integrate myself in with, yeah. with a load of load of strangers that I'd never met before, yeah. you know. Um, and then I did, you know, it was it was a single honest drama, and in the second year and the third year there was a option to do film studies, um, and so that's where you know I was introduced to Marxist critical theory, you know, as we all must be. There you go, back <laughs> there you go. And, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but also, um, I started going to the Scala, mm. the Scala Cinema Club in... I, I I never I never actually went to it when it was in Charlotte Street, but when it had moved to King's Cross, mm. I, I went there regularly. Um, again, because of film night, uh, the all-nighters they did on Saturday nights, but also because you could see anything at the Scala. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Have you seen the brilliant documentary yeah, that, that, yeah. that Jane Giles yeah. did with with Ali Catterall? It's great, and it really captures that vibe of the, of the Scala, which was. I mean, I was always. I mean, it's funny because I was always too scared. I mean, I think part of my going into film as an escape from the world meant that I was a bit scared of the world yeah. generally. Yeah. And so there were things like, you know, I mean, if you watch a documentary, you know, talking about you know, like sex and drugs and rock and roll and all that. And I was a little bit too scared of the world to do all that stuff. But I was, you know, I never called myself punk. I was punk adjacent in that I was a big, I was a punk supporter, but I never did all the punk stuff. Yeah. You know, but I loved all the music. I loved the bands, but I didn't do the clothes. I didn't do, you know. Yeah. And, and so 
you know, I was one of those that went to the Scala for the movies. The screen's stained with beer, the whole place shakes when the tubes run. Sound system's crap, but we love it. Mark Moore at the Scala. The Scala had magic. Let's set up a cinema in the old abandoned embassy from before times. It was like joining a club. People would talk more and more about the Scala. You should go to the Scala. It's really going on there. A very secret club, like a biker gang or something. I thought the Scala was a kind of wonder world. It's like they were a country club for criminals and lunatics and people that were high. You don't, you know, get high on acid and start doing this. Oh, yes. We're showing Mondo Trasher and his film. They found the auteur version of sexploitation. And having felt myself to be a radical feminist, it felt most peculiar. The Scala were kind of outsiders and freaks belonged and felt welcome. And it blew my mind. Which is a good way to see movies. You didn't go there just in case you might trip over somebody having a shag on the carpet. I don't see there's any harm in it at all. I said, I think I have a dead body in my office. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Can you dig it? You don't get that um, in a multiplex. <laughs> Loved the atmosphere, um, even though it was quite intimidating at times. Um, but I saw, and that's where I saw, you know, films like Salo and Andy Warhol's Bad and. Um, you know, all that kind of yeah. really outre stuff that, that 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 you couldn't really see anywhere else. Yeah. You know. Sure. And um I, I remember a double bill of The Driller Killer plus Miss Forty Five Angel of Vengeance. And I remember writing a review of that for the college magazine and stuff. So I was like I did like I I wrote criticism for the college magazine. Mm. I, you know, was doing this, you know, this um film module and yeah, I mean, it, it kind of looked like film was going to be the way to go yeah. for me. But I also got into a directing module as well uh, for theatre directing, and that was actually my graduation piece was a a, a self penned adaptation of Clockwork Orange, and um, and that looked like that's where I was going to go at that point as well. Um, but then after my degree, I kind of just drifted for a few years, um, came back to Cornwall, ended up teaching at New Kitchen Terrace, where my friend Pete Woodward and I introduced the Media Studies GCSC mm. there. Yeah. But then I thought, I hit 30 and thought, now or never. Yeah. You know, um, if I'm going to do something, I really need to do it now. And so I quit teaching and moved to London. And I actually went in via acting. Um, so I did, you know, the usual stuff that actors do when they're trying to get started in London. I did student films. I did, um, you know, fringe theatre above a pub. Um, but then I started getting little parts in films. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess my biggest part was in a a film by Simon Hunter, who is... One of the people who, I don't know if he still teaches at Rain Dance, but he used to teach a lot of Rain Dance. Okay. He's a commercials director who also directs the occasional feature. He did um, ED a few years ago oh, with yeah. um, John Thor's ex wife. Yeah. You know, uh, Peter Hancock. Yeah, yeah, Hancock. Yeah, yeah. Which was a lovely okay. film. Yeah. Simon's a really nice director and a really good bloke. And he, I met him when did he. Did ED out? No, no, that was before I started to, that was before distribution. I think that might have been, I can't remember who did that now. Um, but um, I remember meeting Simon first when the film he was going to do didn't have a budget really, had about 30, 40 grand maybe. And so they were going to do it all, deferred payment. It was going to be shot, I think it was going to be shot down here. Um, and it was basically, this idea was this prison ship is transporting a load of prisoners to a remote island prison, there's this really nasty character in the bowels of the ship mm. who escapes and basically scuppers the boat. The 
remaining cast and a few, uh, the remaining crew and the few kind of prisoners that survive end up on this island where there's a lighthouse and the serial killer basically knocks us all off one by one. Yeah, yeah. And it was quite, you know, a very simple idea. Um, I had no money. And then I didn't hear anything for a long time. And about 18 months later, my agent rings me and went, oh, do you remember a project called Lighthouse? I went, yeah. He goes, well, they've got money now and they, want, they still want you to do it because Simon remembered me from that first meeting. Yeah. And um, I ended up touring with that film around, with Simon, around the International Horror Festival circuit as well. So I met some of my, you know, major kind of, what's, I remember sitting at a dinner with like Adrienne Barbeau and John Carpenter and, you know, people, yeah, yeah. Claudio Simonetti from the, who does the composer from Goblin, yeah, yeah. who does all the Argento music. And I was just like, what am I doing here, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so that was my little entree into European micro budget horror films. Um, but really I kind of hit a glass ceiling, I think with, with acting and part of it was my own self-confidence limitations and now I still got that deep insecurity and didn't think I was good enough. Yeah. Um, and also I started getting more excited about maybe doing my own stuff. I, I auditioned for Mike Lee and that really changed the way that I looked at what I was doing yeah. actually um, because I loved the experience of even just so I did I did the meeting I did the improvisation that you do with Mike um, and I remember doing um, three or four singing auditions as well because it was for Topsy Turvy yeah and uh, didn't get it but you know that experience of just being in here Seeing the way that he approached it really helped, and then when we start, I started doing the um, the twenty four hour film challenges that were well, that were kind of becoming popular at the time. A guy called Johnny Ball used to organise them at the Curzon Soho, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I did that two years running. And the idea being, you know, create a film based on a theme and a title in twenty four hours, and I would I would shoot them and I would direct them, and they would they were basically improvised. Yeah. You know, totally improvised, and and that inspired me to actually want to make my own improvised film. Yeah, which was um, we're talking like two and two thousand and two ish now, and I'd got um, this idea. My mate, my mate John T. Reason, who was an actor that I knew really well, he basically said, "Look, you know, I can pull together, you know, fifteen hundred quid maybe." Um, we can make a really nice short. And I said, well, actually, looking at what we've been doing with the 24-hour film project, with that, we could probably make a, you know, rough as rats feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so we had this idea of doing this feature. And the whole idea was, it was basically going to be taking that approach of the the 24-hour film project uh, in, a, in, a, in informed by the experience I'd had of, of even just into auditioning for Mike Lee. Yeah. And so I started off with like four actors that I knew really well and really liked. One of which is um, a, a, a kind of major figure on the Cornish film scene down here now as an actor, which is Craig Russell. Yeah. And uh, I'd met him in totally coincidentally in London, in London, you know, so when, when I met Craig back down here, I was like, blimey, you know, um, and um, and we basically, I tried to do the whole kind of Mike Lee thing where, you know, I got them to talk about friends they knew and I got them to kind of um, start to become that character and do lots of activities independently. But they were all, I was working independently with each, each actor solo. Mm. Yeah, sending them shopping and watching them do it and that kind of stuff. And after about a month of doing this, I realised that what I'd created was what we'd create were four characters that if I put them in a room together, they would never speak to each other. Yeah. They'd literally all just go to supposing corners and hide. Um, so I thought, like, okay, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just thought, well, let's just really just go for it and, and trust on pe trust people's creativity and yeah. trust their... And that's something that I love to do is I like to trust people. Mm. You know, I trust them to do what they do really well. And um, and I came up with the idea of 
speed dating. And uh, they'd all meet at a speed dating night. And this is kind of quite early. Speed dating was quite a new thing at the time. It was like 2002. And so I then thought, okay, do I just want to have these four key actors and a load of extras? Or do I want a load of actors to create their own characters independently and actually be their own autonomous characters within and then just see what developed? Yeah. And so I ended up with about 11 or 12 actors and I invited them all to this kind of this this this, this kind of um, community hall in in Cross Harbour. I'd already prepped one of my actors who I knew really well, a guy called David Kershaw, and said, "Look, you're going to be my my Rob in this because you're going to be the guy running the speed dating." Mm. I said, "So so basically, we we talked about some stuff together, but really, my brief for pretty much all the actors was." You create your character. You don't tell me. Don't even need to tell me who they are, what they are. Rock up on the day, as long as you've got a backstory for the character, as long as you've got a reason for coming speed dating, and as long as you've got an ulterior motive. That's all I want. Yeah. And and basically, we we all rocked up on that that morning. I'd somehow managed to get about fifteen people to be involved as a crew just on this insane project, including an amazing first AD who had just been working as a third or fourth AD on a Harry Potter movie. And I said, why do you want to help? Why do you want to do this? And she was, oh, I just want to help. Mm. You know, and uh, and basically we just did the speed dating that morning mm. as an improvisation. I had people taking notes about what sort of things would happen. We, we chose a few moments mm. And basically shot the first 20 minutes of the feature film in the weekend. Wow. And after that, based on people's availability, we then followed what was happening, you know, with, yeah. with each couple. And after about four or five days, I knew what the ending was going to be. But they didn't. <laughs> and it was, it, I, I could just see it coming. I could just, like a car crash coming. Um, and, you know, it is rough as rats. So I look at it now and go, you know, technically it's, I mean, the acting is excellent i mean that's the thing that i love about it the acting is absolutely excellent everyone's completely real there's a lot of heart in it there's just technically you know it's not great and um i mean it sounds just about passable the camera work is shocking (laughs) really shocking um but you know it was enough to it played a few little festivals um it played a couple of those minor festivals that people send films too like in there was one in hot in cut a couple in la mm. there was one in um there was a lovely festival in canada and toronto called real heart mm. that gave us the the best film um which was which was great because it gave me a chance to to meet atom mcgoyan which was a big yeah, yeah. big that was a big moment for me because yeah. he was one of my heroes mm. um and i'm hoping to do like Maybe Exotica plus Sweet Hereafter or something down here at some point, um, and um, and of course it it got the audience award at the Cornwall Film Festival in two thousand and five. Um, I then made a few shorts after that, including a funded short for the Cornwall Film and the kind of digital shorts program. Yeah, digital shorts, yeah. Because I think Mark Jenkins had done one the year before. I was in the cohort with Brett Harvey. And um, Jane Pugh, I think, wrote one for a guy called, I forget his name now, mm. Ornette, on, on, Ornette Spensley, I think he was called. But basically it was that 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 cohort that, that I was with with Brett when he did that wonderful kind of young people in the ca- council estate short. It was great. Yeah. And um, and actually the experience really, really damaged me. Yeah. I found, you know, I had... The, the funded short. The funded short yeah. really damaged me, actually, because there were... It was my first time dealing with um, commissioners yeah. and dealing with, I mean, basically I was given a script editor who was great, actually. She was really great. And we we came up with this really nice script. And my plan was to, to play with the toys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> having, done, having done, you know, my really rough improvised short, I thought what I'd really like to do, if I've got a little bit of money, is to try some of the stuff in De Palma. 
kind of thing, or Hitchcock, or you know, De Palma was again somebody that was really influential on me as a as a film goer. Yeah, and um, and so I wanted to have like tracking shots going through walls. I wanted to have you know all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And and so we'd created this script, which I absolutely loved, and it was all about ratcheting up tension. And the feedback I got from, because there was a BFI commissioner, well, it was, I think it was somebody based in Sheffield. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, not going to name any names here, apart from Pippa Best, who was brilliant. Um, so there was somebody from there, there was somebody from Southwest, uh, you know, Southwest Screen in, in Bristol, and there was Pippa from yeah. Cornwall Film. And so I had these three different people who all just went, we don't get it. Yeah. Is it a comedy? Is it a drama? Is it a thriller? Is it a horror? And I went, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was. Because if, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, if you watch, if you watch a De Palma movie, it's all of those yeah, things, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, and the trouble was, so I basically was told to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. I think I did 13 rewrites. And eventually I wrote what I called my fuck you draft, which was, I just turned it into a horror movie. And I mean, the premise was really simple. It was just a guy coming back to murder this woman and basically ends up being in a cupboard, waiting for her to come in. And she has a piano delivered. The cupboard, the piano gets put in front of the cupboard. He's stuck. The end. That was it. Basically, it was half a page of A4, and but we created this really elaborate. You know, there's a there's a heater in the cupboard, and it turns on, and it gets all sweaty, and she's got a little dog, and it was all this stuff. It was really hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, I just went, okay. If you don't know what it, if you don't know what it is that I'm writing, I'm just going to write this horror film. Mm -hmm. And it was basically, I went, okay, is this woman, uh, this guy. He's coming to murder his old piano teacher and she browbeats him so much when she's confronting him that he, in the end, can do nothing but immolate himself. Yeah. There was this psychological browbeat. Yeah. And they went, I really don't... We, again, they all just went, we don't know what this is, we hate this. But Pippa just went, it'll be all right, I'll, I'll, I'll sort it. We, we shot it. And half of it's really good, mm -hmm. half of it's not. Because the one thing that I forgot to do was look after my actors mm. when we shot it. I was so I was so stuck with the toys and everything. Yeah. Anyway, um, I remember we did a screening of it in London. Well, Pippa organised a Southwest screen, uh, sorry, a Cornwall film showcase. And so there was, they were talking about Midnight Drive, so they were talking about Bill Scott's film, yeah. they were talking about the documentary. They showed the digital shorts from that cohort. And I remember... Um, being in the uh, in the bar afterwards, and somebody, I think it was somebody from Screen International, was like talking to me, and of course he just went, "So tell me about your relationship with your piano teacher, Ben." <laughs> and I went, "I never had a piano teacher." <laughs> and he goes, "Well, what's your film about then?" And I went, "Well, this film is about a tortured artist who is being browbeaten by powerful women, and in the end, he could do nothing but hurt himself." And Pippa was like, no, that, that's not, that's, in fact, it's just joking. And Brett just looked over and went, you know what? That's not even subtext. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and yeah. and it was awful because I just found the whole experience, and I think it was partly stuff to do with my mum and partly to do with my, you know, my formative experiences about being scared about, you know, and, and in the end, it was just, all that stuff just was triggered yeah. by that whole experience. And I didn't make another film for four years. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's amazing how damaging a lot of the the stuff that is aspirational in terms of like where you want to get to is can be. You know, yeah. and I do remember. Yeah, I think I think I was talking to Mark about it a long time ago. And he just went, was just, well, he said, well, you know, just give him all the drafts and just shoot your film. And I, was, I wish I had, like Mark, and I, but I wish I had the courage. Do you yeah. know? I mean, I mean, that's the one thing that I will, you know, I really admire about Mark is his his vision yeah. and he won't compromise that vision yeah. and it's something i've always admired about his work yeah. you know i really have for well, sure um we should mention that one of the festivals that didn't screen the feature was mine which he reminded me of in camp, <laughs> <laughs> in camp which i completely I, i'm sorry i don't know I, and that wasn't me trying no, to be, no. you know it was uh <laughs> it was a very nice and awkward moment for me uh 
sorry. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I thought I, I have to put it on record. Um, <laughs> and actually, you know, I don't blame you. Do you know what I mean? Because I mean, technically, it's 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 really rough. Um, you know, and it's one of those films that if if it didn't grab you early on in terms of the quality of the acting or the idea, yeah. then well, I don't blame you. I don't remember the film from way back. You know, that, that's me being honest. But you know. We did turn down a lot of stuff. We liked a lot of indie stuff. We liked a lot of stuff. But it just, we were a, was just space. Yeah, you know, absolutely. In, in a, I, I know, you know, you know, so I know that. I'm not saying we, that's the reason, but it wouldn't have, you know, we loved seeing that kind of stuff. And it was, we showed a lot of stuff which a lot of festivals didn't show, um, including, you know, Golden Burn by Mark, you know, back yeah. in, I think probably 2002 as well, you know, like, but yeah, a festival in Luton couldn't, we weren't fully independent, not for a long time, no, because of that. But yes, yeah. um, so let's bring it up to date because I think yeah. what's interesting is is hearing you talk about your formative experiences screening films for other people, and when you talk about that versus talking about that kind of you know the filmmaking experience, there's a sense of you film are very much at home, curating and sharing, and almost like you know you're building community um, in terms of certainly the film club you know, feels like a real community. But but it, maybe that is why you kind of moved into distribution in terms of, you know, seeing things, wanting to share them and and sort of, and, and bringing people together for a kind of shared experience yeah. with a particular film. Absolutely. I mean, and actually that's kind of, when I think about myself as a filmmaker, I was always about empowering other people. Yeah, it does sound like that. Right? And facilitating their... their their skills yeah. and their and what's great about them you know and i think that's something that i really have always valued you know and i think that's what i do now with the distribution yeah um because i remember you know i found the whole you know when i did the encounters i went to can and you know that's why i discovered it was a business really did not i mean i really yeah, yeah. kind of it opened my eyes. This was like 2005, and my eyes just went ping. You know, I I was like, and again, that found I found that very intimidating and scary. Um, and and so I, after that time, I started going to Cannes quite regularly. Not every year, but I think about three or four years when I did go every year. And I was just to find the whole business side of Cannes really intimidating. Going and going. And also the whole kind of networking thing, because one thing about me is that even though I'm about kind of building community and I'm quite, you know, I'm quite a character, sometimes that character is just a, a heightened version of who I really am because I'm trying to, mm. you know, because I'm actually kind of quite very shy and yeah. secure inside. And I, I remember, you know, so the idea of going to lots of parties and stuff would just, or try to, even worse, trying to get into parties when I wasn't invited, mm. which, of course, all my people that I was hanging around with wanted to do. And I was like, oh, I really hate this. And I remember in 2013, I think, may have been around that sort of time, I met up with a friend from Cornwall, bumped into someone from Cornwall there, and they were hanging out with somebody who was a, an actor who was very, very into networking. I really wanted to get to every party and every party, and let's look... And I remember being dragged along in the, in the wake of that for about a week. And it was the most miserable experience. And I hated every minute of it. And I, after that, just went, okay, I'm not going to do any of that stuff in Cannes. I'm just going to watch films. Yeah. And so the next few years, um, I would go, and I, I had this little group of people that I would share an apartment with every year. So David Madison, who's my partner in 606, um, Stuart Wright, who runs a lovely, lovely podcast oh, called Brit for Brit yeah. Stuart Wright from Britflix, and he does that lovely Britflix podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Sam Ashurst, who does the Arrow podcast with Dan Martin, my old mate Dan Martin. Um, and and so the few that we would share this apartment every year, and um, and they'd go off and do their businessy things or whatever. But for me, it was all about just watching movies. Yeah, I was kind of going back to my roots, really, and just going, okay, four or five films a day. And if there's something that looks interesting and I couldn't get a ticket for it, 
I would queue for three hours yeah. to get a get a return for it. I remember um, queuing up for three hours for what all it said in the program was it's a lesbian coming of age story, and it was three hours long. And could you possibly mean it, can I wonder? <laughs> and it was in the it was in the competition, and I remember couldn't get a ticket for it, so I just queued. I just yeah. queued in for a turn, and I got a beautiful seat at the front. And literally within the first five minutes, I went, this film's going to win the Palm Door. Mm. I just knew it. And that was, of course, Blue is the Warmest Colour. Mm. I just went, this film is extraordinary. And it was everything. So I love the Dardens and I love that kind of, you know, that kind of authentic kind of feel. And, you know, literally, I think it was just a shot of Adela Arcopolis coming out of, a, out of her house. She's late for the bus. The bus is at the end of the street. She's running for it. She misses it. I just went, this is exactly my kind of film. I don't know why. <laughs> and I just, then I loved it. Anyway, um, but, you know, and I and I did that for a number of years. You know, from that year onwards, I was, it was all about watching movies. Yeah. And it was just about watching movies and just immersing myself in, and looking for those films that I just, that really touched me and moved me. Um, and then in 2018, I was about, you know, a week into the festival and I was in the Palais, and there were four screening rooms next to each other, two of which were showing a film at 6 p.m. One was a film about a lot of people on a boat. Um, I think it was called The Raft or something. It was a documentary-type film. The other one was a film that I'd never heard of called Touch Me Not. And I just went into that. Yeah. And I'd been doing quite a lot of therapy with somebody really good in London um, and a lot of kind of dealing with, you know, the root issues of insecurity and all this kind of stuff. And and she was very much a kind of physical kind of, not, it was a lot of talking therapy, but also some physical stuff as yeah, well. Yeah. And I remember watching this film, Touch Me Not, which is on Mubi at the yeah. moment. And I didn't know it had won the Golden Bear. At Berlin, I didn't didn't even know that. I just it was a film that looked interesting, and in it, a woman has a woman in her fifties has lost touch with her her sexuality and her 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 own sense of self. And the director of the film is part of the film, and she's making a film about. And so actually, what it is is this woman's an actress who's playing a character, kind of the whole Mike Lee thing, yeah. the whole kind of you know, that whole kind of improvisation stuff that I come from. Yeah. But she's put into real therapeutic situations mm. to deal with this problem. So there's like a, an extraordinary touch therapy workshop. There's um, meeting this transgender hooker in Berlin. There's this guy called Shawnee Love, who is a sex therapist based in Brighton. And there was a scene in it about an hour into the film, and it's in the trailer, where this guy is kind of pushing her buttons and he's kind of provoking her and provo they're standing face to each other. And at one point, he just touches her in that point between the collarbones, you know, where they yeah. meet. Yeah. And he just touches it out and she just explodes at him. And I felt like I'd been punched in the chest at yeah. that moment. I, it just, I, I almost recoiled into my seat. And I just went, this is real. Mm. And even though it's been created in a contrivance, it's absolutely real what's happening in that moment. And and I knew because I'd actually had a very similar experience myself in therapy literally about three weeks before. Mm. And so I came out of this film and I was raving about it to everybody I met. You know, when I was back in the apartment, I was like, this film, you've got to go and see this film, it's amazing. Everybody I met in parties, everybody I met... and. And eventually, my mate David, who I share the apartment with every year, just went, okay, Pat, this film, do you think anybody's going to pick it up for the UK? I went, I don't know, I doubt it. It's a tough, it's a tough sell. Yeah. Um, and he said, so what would you do? I said, well, in an ideal world, I'd love to try and pick it up and see if we can release it. Because I had a really clear idea of having been in the therapeutic community, mm -hmm. I had an idea of who it could be sold to. Yeah. You know, I, I had a real sense of audience. And he said, well, why don't we then? And so I, I sent this email to the sales agent who made an appointment to see me the next day. 
And David and I rocked up with no background, with no credentials, with no experience, and were treated as if we were, t you know, we were treated like serious contenders. Yeah. You know, we were, we were actually treated with great respect and great, well, you know, basically, it was as if, you know, I was very op open about my lack of experience. Yeah. I was very open about that. And I think that honesty really helped. But they they were just like, yeah, you know, here's what we here's what we would need you to do for us to take it, yeah, for us to consider your application, yeah, yeah. Uh, your your bid. And so I had to contact people at, at Creative Europe. I had to contact people at BFI, you know, just to kind of get a sense of where I might qualify for funding. Yeah. And I actually texted, you now I Facebooked Mia Bates, who is mm. the head of film production now at, at the BFI. Um, I knew her from years ago. She was on a, she, um, I met her through the microwave project at Film London. Oh, right, yeah. Because I was actually attached as a director to a project in the first microwave oh, wow. round. And um, and somehow we'd become friends on Facebook, even though we hadn't spoken for you know, 15, 20 years or whatever. And I actually just Facebooked her and went, look, I know you run Reclaim the Frame. There are some elements of this film that I'm not sure if they're, yeah, because it's a lot of it kind of goes into BDSM and it gets into all kinds of stuff. And I was like, I'm not sure how to put it in a in a kind of I can't quite think of the phrase. How how kind of um, politically correct or acceptable yeah, yeah, yeah. aspects of the films are. And she just came back a few days later, going, I've heard it's a really serious film about really you know it's got a lot of integrity. You know, I don't think you'd have any kind of pushback wanting to release it. In the end, I didn't get it, but Mubi bought it in the end. And um, what it did, though, is it actually sparked something. Because mm. when I left uni back in 1987, I did some temping. And when I was temping, I, tempted to, I was temping for a medical insurance company. And I was connected, I was, I was often talking to HR people at big companies. Mm one of which was um, UIP, you know, International, you know, yeah. you know who basically was CIC Home Video. And, and the person there was, because we were chatting about films and stuff when I was, even when I was then. And she was like, we've got a few jobs coming up, coming for an interview. Mm -hmm. And I remember being interviewed by somebody who just went, we love, I really love you, Pat. I think you're great. He said, but the trouble is I need, I need a clerical assistant. Mm -hmm. And if I give you a job within about three months, you're going to be internally moving up through the ranks. He said, I, I, can't, I, I can't afford to take you on. So I'd actually kind of flirted with distribution yeah, yeah. Wow. then. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but now, you know, so, so basically 606 was born in 2018 from me seeing that film. And I then... Um, we didn't get touch me not, but we then thought, okay, what sort of films are we interested in? I'm, I'm, and I'm always, I'm always about authenticity. I'm always about believing what's happening. Mm. I, I need to believe that the people involved in making the film are sincere, that it it touches me somehow. And I think partly because of my upbringing and my sensitivity as a yeah. person, um, you know, I was drawn to films that were often written and directed by women, mm. often um, featuring young people um, or people that are being ostracised or are outside of society somehow. So the first film we picked up, well, actually we picked up two on a, at the same time with the same sales agent. One was um, a, a French... German co-production called uh, Polina. Mm. It was about a young Russian um, child in in who trains for the the um, Bolshoi, and then when she qualifies for the Bolshoi, um, actually runs away to France to do um, contemporary dance with this guy that she meets from France, and then when that doesn't work out for her because she's too rigid for contemporary dance, she's too rebellious for ballet. 
is all about her finding her own voice mm. and and you know I, i'm sure there's a parallel to my own life is there somewhere um but then the other one was um this extraordinary beautiful film called uh hannah yeah with um with charlotte rampling mm. um directed by andrea paloro whose film monica i released last december and um and of course that's about somebody who you know because of her sticking with her husband when he goes into jail and her supporting him is ostracized by society and as the film goes on and on and on her world gets smaller and smaller and smaller yeah. and it's and it was funny until i i didn't realize until i watched it with an audience that it is an existential horror film yeah you know it really is it's about someone's world being crushed yeah um and uh you know two really nice titles to launch with yeah for sure you know and um and i remember going up to a big event in london it was a, um, a slate day it's where basically distributors get a chance to stand up and present what's coming to a load of exhibitors and i literally got in you know we'd signed the contract like two days before the film before for this event and they gave me a last minute slot and i remember just standing in front of 300 exhibitors going hi my name is pat 606 distribution i'm totally new don't really know what i'm doing but i've got a lot of heart mm. and here are the films i've got and aren't these amazing and ever since then i've had a really good support from the industry yeah. actually a lot of people uh, you know i think i've built up a really nice kind of reputation quite yeah. quickly and i think it's because i come in and just go look I'm totally honest. I don't necessarily know. Yeah. Um, but I really believe in this project. But you're a film person, aren't you? And, you know, there's not many film people out there, like real film people, film, you know. And I think that from the conversations we've had about how difficult it is for a small indie distributor in the current climate, um, you, you have a lot of champions in, you know, key... Uh, venues around the country where film people are kind of clinging on you know yeah. and that 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 is that sense of community again you're part of that community aren't you as well because it's like those people are out there selling films there's more films than ever but but how are they how are they doing it and why are they doing it and 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 and, and does you know do do people who are kind of putting films on feel like feel like they're working with film people that that feels that feels really rare yeah, and I mean, I, I know I'm very, I've been very fortunate to know a number of people in the industry, in the mm. distribution industry, who who really feel the same way that I do. Mm. I mean, there's Johnny Toll, who is a brilliant. He he he, you know, I mean, he's got a lovely film at the moment called Driving Mum, which is beautiful. But he's a really, he and he's been a great support to me over the years. But also in the venues, I mean, there's obviously Mark Cosgrove and the team at the Watershed. I mean, mm. Steph Reed now is now doing a lot of the programming yeah. now um, but and they're they're great people i mean they're really good and you know jason wood who is now obviously the bfi but when he was at home in manchester was like a really big champion of mine which i'll always be grateful for paul gallagher at glasgow mm. you know there are lots of really good people out there who who you know even if they can't book it on date they will book it at some yeah. point you know and well they're all film people aren't they you know exactly you know exactly and um you know and it's tough it's really tough and and interestingly talking about that you know the, the idea of um having that group of people i mean i'm, I'm i mean they're all feeling the same pressures that we are right now yeah yeah and that there is just too too much content out there mm. or or rather too many really good films to choose from yeah and and so you know pre-lockdown you know i might have been able to be confident about maybe getting 10 venues to book my film on the, to, to, on the week of release yeah you know like with ilaha my most recent release it was five mm. you know and that's not any aspersion on any of those programmers because they've actually just got so many films to, yeah. to, to kind of try and show and it is actually becoming a bit of an issue yeah in the industry generally was one of the venues the the garden cinema yeah, the garden was. I mean, yeah. they've, they've been really helped. I mean, again, it's uh, that's a venue that's been that was quite new. Yeah, you know, in in terms of if they weren't around when I started, 
but yeah, they've 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 shown pretty much every every one of my films on date. Pretty yeah, because we 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 we've done a lot of stuff with them through the podcast. They really like the podcast, and I was up there for the first time. I went to see the Teachers Loud, but there was a trailer. What for a great, what a great film, the Teachers. Yeah, I really liked it. Yeah, but yeah, and there was a you know the trailer for that and the poster. It was great to see. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, again like film people. You know, yeah, just exactly. in that space, you just like you know. And we, I talk, we talked about that on, the, on, a, on a recent episode. Um, well, let's not get too, let's not get too down to end because I want to end with, um, <laughs> with, with what is a joyous thing, which is your film club. Yeah. Just in terms of, yeah, like what, what led you to set it up now again in this iteration? Well, I, I don't think it's a new thing. It's definitely an, an iteration of, 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 of what I've been doing problem. a lot over my, over yeah. my life. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like what's, where are you at in terms of, where are you at in terms of six oh six and the film clock? Because it feels like, despite the challenges, you just you just committed to bringing people together to watch really interesting stuff, which is yeah. so exciting. And I think that's also why I I, I relate so strongly with exhibitors as a, as a distributor. Mm. You know, because there's always been this kind of artificial division between just exhibitors and distribution distributors yeah, yeah, yeah. because of you know distributors have often seen as people who just are talking about money and a, and a deal and 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 I think because I'm a film person and, and actually for me. It's about, I mean, it'd be lovely if I could make a living, but it's actually about saying, look, we've got this great film. Yeah. And I want, you know, I want to share it with people. Yeah. And I remember when I first started 606, um, I went to see my friend Jack Morrison, who has just left Feast um, in, in Red Roof. Yeah. Um, and I knew Jack from... When, I, when I'd when done my degree, I came back to Cornwall. Jerry Fringe was ill for a term. And so Paul Viper asked me if I would go and do some cover lecturing at Cornwall College. This is like 1987, 88, probably 88. And as part of that, I directed a production of Accidental Death and Anarchists with the students. And actually, it's one of my strongest friendships came from that. Like Phil Innes, it was in it, and he's a local musician, educator, all round polymath, and um, Jack Morrison was in there, uh, there as well. And I remember going to see Jack, and because he's a brilliant ideas person as well, he he clarifies loose thinking better than anybody I know. And um, I said, Jack, you know, I've just started this film distribution company. Any thoughts about how I might either get some support from Cornwall or just, you know, any thoughts? And he just went, well, it's Pat's Film Club, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and he said that in 2018. Yeah. And he said, he said, it's just like you used to show films and, you know, your house. And I went, it is really. And, um, and, and so actually he came up with the idea and I, I then sat on it because I, I wanted to try and do the way the industry does it kind mm-hmm. of thing. And then... The thing that triggered it, I mean, obviously COVID was a big thing and that had, that had a major impact on my on what I still think is the best film I've had, um, which is a German film called System Crasher, yeah. which was basically killed by COVID. Hello, Dina. Na, geht's Ihnen gut heute? Hey! Warum atmest du nicht, du Arschloch? Ah! Ich bin so Mama! Wenn die Profis noch nicht mal mit dir klarkommen, wie soll ich das dann schaffen? Sie sind ihre Mutter. <lacht> Benny braucht eine langfristige Lösung. Ja. Hey, erzähl, du darfst dich einfach in mein Zimmer. Ich bin ein Schulbegleiter. Benny! Ich mach mal einen Vorschlag. 1-1 Betreuung. Drei Wochen im Wald. Wo ist denn der Fernseher? Gibt's nicht. Kein Strom, kein Internet. Und schön ist bloß so kacken. Ich hasse dir! Hey! Weil ich mal so auszicke, darf ich nicht zu Mama. Oh, das kannst du dir erinnern. Hast du schon mal dein Echo gehört? Mama! Mama! Mama hasst mich. Ich hab schon eine Familie, Benny. Und du auch. Ich habe manchmal richtig Angst vor ihm. Ich kann es nicht mehr. Verabschieden Sie sich wenigstens von Ihrer Tochter! Fick dich! Ich 
verliere die nötige Distanz. Wie ist das jetzt Ihr Ernst? Älter du wirst, desto beschissener werden die Maßnahmen. Ich hab die Verantwortung für dich! Keine Sorge, das ist Sicherheitsglas. Erzähl. Wie heißt ich? Ekelmaßmensch. Na, also wird er. Ähm. And. I. You know, I was watching all the cinemas doing these kind of. at home, you know, kind of things and trying to build communities. And Imogen Weatherly, who runs. Um, The, the the kind of community cinema thing for uh, down here in Cornwall. Sea film. Sea film, that's right. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. I totally forgot the word. She runs sea film. And she'd create this great online kind of watching films together and chatting about them online thing during during lockdown. It was utterly brilliant. And um, I noticed as the cinemas were reopening that audiences weren't necessarily coming back unless it's for a big blockbuster. Yeah. And, that, and that's still the case <laughs> right now. The yeah. audiences aren't coming back unless it's like a massive, you know, massive film. And even then, The Fall Guy did. Exactly. Did I know. Well, well, that was a big surprise to me. Yeah. Um, so you've had the, this whole kind of franchise filmmaking has also affected, like, new big releases, like with The Fall Guy. Yeah. Emily Blunt, Ryan Gosling, you know... An established old TV show, yeah. but also what well, looks like—I mean, I'm not seeing it yet—but a good, fun film. Yeah, and people just weren't coming, and it's so strange. Anyway, so I basically went to Plymouth one day, and I saw this um, Telugu film called R R R Triple R. Oh yeah, 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 and. I don't know why, because I mean, you know, films from India hadn't really necessarily appealed to me hugely, yeah. but I was just blown away for like three and a half hours. It was a ball. It was just so good. And I just thought, people have really got to see this. They've really got to see this. Yeah. And um, and it didn't play anywhere in Cornwall. So I contacted my old friend Cy Harvey, who... I helped with the distribution of Brett's film Long Way Back. Yeah. Um, and I said, look, you know, I've got this idea that I'd like to contact a cinema in Cornwall and see if we could, like, create a night where I might be able to bring films that are more rarefied or unusual for Cornwall. Yeah. And and he said, well, I've, I'm, I've got really good contacts with... Mark Williams at WCW and the team here at the Plaza, um, I can I can set you up a meeting. So I met up with Mark Williams and and the team, and I just said, look, here's my idea. One night a month, you let me program something, and the idea being that you pay for the film, I pay for the marketing. Let's see what happens. Yeah, and we had about fifty people come to that showing of RRR and. Everybody was raving about it, and everybody was raving about the idea, and so that's really where Pat's Film Club, we you know kind of grew really, and and so now I mean it's coming, it's going to be two years in August. Wow! And I'm I'm kind of hoping I'm, I haven't spoken to you yet, but I'm kind of hoping that I might want to bring our, our Triple R back, just as a kind of nostalgic thing. And also for the people who didn't see it the first time, which includes me, I, I, you I know, missed that screening. I mean, I know it's been on. I know it's been on Netflix for two years now, but actually, it's not the same. It's really not the same. I remember my mate Phil, his wife, watched it because she couldn't come. Uh, she had stuff at home to do. She said, "Well, look, I'll watch it on Netflix at the same time as we're showing it here." And she wouldn't. Uh, he came home raving about it, and she went, oh, "I turned it off after ten minutes." You know, it's because it's that kind of, yeah, yeah. that difference. Yeah, yeah. And it is a, you know, so I'm, I don't know. Well, it's an idea that I'm hoping to do anyway. But, um, yeah, so basically now it's a combination of films that, I mean, they're normally all classic films generally, but it's films that either haven't been shown in Cornwall for a long time or haven't been shown at all, um, or they're just old favourites mm -hmm. that, that we're bringing back. And and I sometimes feel a little bit kind of eggy bringing back 
like really old favourites. Mm. But but the idea, I guess, is to try and balance it out. So I will bring, you know, so hopefully, like when I did, a, a, you know, I did Alien and Aliens a year ago, and we had like 150 people here. And then I followed it with, um, I forget what it was now, but it was something quite small. Yeah. And we had about 50, yeah. you know, and, and so hopefully by, it's a whole kind of programming thing, isn't it? You want to kind of make it all balance out. Yeah. You know, and um, so like next week we've got The Warriors and Deliverance, you know, as a double bill. And for me, the double bill is about, you know, that idea is thematically, it's about people caught in a hostile environment trying to get home. Mm. You know, it's, and to me, it's like a really obvious yeah, thing, yeah. you know. Um, like when, you know, um, and uh, yeah, so basically, We've got, you know, this kind of rolling agreement now that, that basically, you know, it's all seems to be going really well and, and they seem to be really supportive of what we're doing. Um, my hope is that people are coming to see films on Pat's Film Club and then seeing what's coming up at the plaza yeah, and, and kind of cross-pollinating, you know. Yeah. Um, and we mentioned earlier on about uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is part of a new horror offshoot that you're kind of doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here, I mean, yeah. So I'm, I'm now hoping. Well, I'm now launching Pat's Horror Night here at the Plaza as well. So it's Pat's Horror Film Club, <laughs> and so that'll be a second night. Yeah. Um, and and again, it's going to be uh, about either classic or 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 horror films that haven't been shown down here. You know, because for some reason, a lot of the even mainstream releases on the horror genre tend not to come down so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so we're starting with Texas Chainsaw Massacre because it's the 50th anniversary this year and more entertainment who have got the rights for it um, are going to be doing a nationwide kind of that week at the weekend of 14th, 15th or 16th of June mm. all over the country. And and it wasn't going to get booked down here yeah. by anybody. So I basically said to the plaza, look, I'd love to launch this Pat's Horror Film Club. We've been talking about it for about a year. And then um, I then suggested that, I, I then contacted other venues in Cornwall and said, look, get on board, this thing's happening. Yeah. Um, so now we've got five Cornish cinemas going to be playing it. Nice. Um, we've also got Plymouth Arts Centre, which is one of my favourite venues. And Anna there has been so supportive of me over the years. Eggs to Phoenix and Claire Horrockster has been supportive of me as well. And also the Create Studios in Swindon, which is just a small um, arts kind of venue. Though, in fact, there, it's not going to be so much a Pat's Film Club. It's going to be their under-25 programmers night. So, you know, it's going to be... I'm, I'm helping them get the film there, yeah. but they're kind of promoting it as their own kind of young program yeah, this yeah. night. Um, and my hope is that so all these cinemas will have it as like a Pat's Film Club kind of branded thing. Some of the venues that I can physically get to, I will. So I'm, obviously I'm doing here on the Friday night because it's my local. And I know that WTW are going to let me, uh, sorry, Merlin are going to let me do uh, an intro at a couple of their screenings. So, so basically I'm going to be doing a, a live kind of pre pre uh, present the film on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday down here in Cornwall. There's also going to be like a recorded intro by me, um, but hopefully from talent from the film as well. And I'm going to be giving out my usual kind of goodies. So it's going to be like printed, it's going to be some printed program notes, which is unusual for me. But also it's going to be like a badge and there's going to be like a little souvenir postcard and that kind of stuff. What happened was true. The most bizarre and brutal series of crimes in America.
This is the movie that is just as real. Just as close. Just as terrifying as being there. Even if one of them survives, what will be left? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. My uh, my Robocop badge gets a lot of comments from the Robocop uh, Total Recall Double Bill. Um, if I could put a request in for Horror Night uh, of, a, of a film which I love, um, I don't know if you is the the Spanish horror film The Orphanage. Oh, it's great! Yeah, is, yeah. And it, when everyone on oh, no, like, that's um, and just to round off, you mentioned cross pollination there, um, which is kind of what you're doing with Six Hundred Six in terms of like, you know, dipping a toe into rep kind of old movies which obviously is is very much you know one of the driving ethos of the of the film club is kind of reintroducing films um and then yeah kind of uh so it sounds like yeah all, all of these things are kind of coming together for you in terms of they are and and actually if i have a big picture for it all which i kind of do is that actually they will cross pollinate in that what i'm really looking to do is to establish myself as someone that people trust you know i'm not a critic you know so i'm not like you know mark kermode or peter bradshaw or whatever i'm not a well-known director or anything but what i'd like to be i'd like to kind of build a personal brand i guess mm. through pat's film club as someone that if i kind of recommend something people will go okay we trust pat's taste yeah you know and i remember when we showed harold and maud here um, at the beginning, before the film began, I said I wanted a quick show of hands. I went, "How many people have, have how many of you have seen this before?" And about ten people put their hand up, and and there were about sixty people in the audience. So I actually, I actually asked the question. I said, "So why are you here?" And somebody just shouted out, "Because we trust you." Yeah, and that's what I'm looking for. And so you know, through Pat's Film Club, hopefully then. If I was to mention via Pat's Film Club that I've got a new release of Six Oh Six, people would go, "Okay, we trust Pat. We'll we'll have, we'll give it a go," yeah, yeah. you know. So hopefully the whole thing will become like this big kind of yeah. thing. But um, yeah, so I've got two two new acquisitions of Six Oh Six, one of which is very much a traditional Six Oh Six title. It's a German Scottish co production that played at Glasgow Film Festival and did really well. Is called Falling Into Place, directed by a German, young, a uh, uh, youngish German director called um, Eileen Tetzel, who um, is one of those people who, and I'm spotting this at the moment, there's a, there's a whole kind of European cross pollination of directors and performers um, who are fairly fluid in terms of being able to, maybe dual nationality or whatever, because she's German based, well, she's German, but she, like, for example, appeared in Scrapper, mm, okay. you know, the Charlotte well, Reagan film. I recognize, recognize that name. Yeah, and yeah. so it's her first feature, um, and it's a 30-something kind of romance film, and it's, you know, and it's really lovely. And visually, it's reminiscent of Once, John Carney's okay. film, okay. And, which is mm. one of my favorite films of all time. Um, so that had me a hello, really. Yeah, yeah. And it's set, uh, set on the Isle of Skye and in London. And um, so that's playing at Raindance Film Festival on the 19th, on the Friday. And so that's my success so acquisition that's very much in the mould of what I love to do. Yeah. Um, and 606 has also acquired our first kind of heritage title or vintage title um, from 1980, um, called The Stuntman, directed by Richard Rush. Um, Peter O'Toole was nominated for an Oscar in it. Steve Rails back. It was his first film, uh, feature film. He'd already done Helter Skelter on TV, yeah. but it was his first feature film, and Barbara Hershey. And that is all about um, a guy on the run from the police who gets involved in an accident where a stuntman dies. And... Peter O'Toole plays the megalomaniac director, Eli Cross, who basically takes this guy and says, well, look, 
if the if 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 people know that someone died on my set, the film will get closed down. So you're going to be this person. Yeah. You're going to impersonate him for the rest of the shoot. And uh, and so it's a kind of comedy. It's got incredible stunt work, yeah. um, which hopefully will tie in with the BFI promotion of action films in September, October, November. And um, there's a romance with Barbara Hershey. And it's also this whole thing about reality and illusion. And, you know, because our lead character, Steve Robert's character, is paranoid as a person, he starts to think that the director actually wants to kill him on front of the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, um, yeah, it's everything I love about movies, really, in that it's very sophisticated, but it's also a crowd pleaser. Yeah. And it ties in very much with what I'm trying to do with Pat's Film Club, which is to show amazing old older films to a new audience, you know. So that may well be a new direction for 606 as well. Well, uh, let's hope so. And uh, long may long may it all continue, Pat. Thank you, Neil. I mean, it's, you know, it's, as we all know, it's a perilous journey trying to actually make a living doing it. But I, I must admit, I've not been more fulfilled creatively than I have been in the last six years since I started 606, really. I never thought distribution was creative. I really didn't. But I now realise how important it is as part of the you know, especially because I'm coming at it from a a, a position of sharing yeah. great stuff. You know, I'm not coming at it. I mean, as I said, it'd be lovely if I could actually make a profit sometime. But what it's all about ultimately for me is being in front of, you know, 100 people and just watch it all behind them, just watching them loving a film. Yeah. And also, like when I'm working with directors and stuff, the shows that I, I mean, I always try to get the director over for a Q and A or whatever. And for me to be sitting in the back of a room while someone is getting the acclaim and the and the validation and the, you know, the the response from an audience that they deserve, you know, that's what that 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 is some of the best times that I have as a distributor. Charlotte Rampling at the Curzon Curzon Soho, no Curzon Mayfair in front of 400 people with all these people loving the film that she's done yeah. even though it's a tiny little film that was part of she did she did it out of love yeah to actually have that kind of validation and i you know to me it's it's so important i mean it was it was important for me when i made films and I, when i was an actor and i think you know it's really important for for people who make films to know that people really love what they do yeah you know well, thanks for thanks for all your work bringing all this cinema to us. Thanks been lovely for, to chat to. You. Thank you, Neil. It's been it's been a pleasure, and uh, I don't look forward to your editing job. <laughs> <laughs> I probably won't edit it. I'll just leave it as it is. Oh my. <laughs>